being here this morning. It's an honor to get to be here, to get to have this much of your time. See about it. Uh, Hold everything. We are not doing the New Testament survey. I'm sorry. I've got to interrupt it. I hate not finishing projects. I'm one of these people who if he starts something, as, as Steve calls it, a box checker. I like to check the box that I finished it. Okay, yeah, there, we've got several box checkers in here. Okay, this box is on hold, but just for one year. <laughs> it all started on a cold and dreary winter day. I was in trial up in the Northeast. It was a trial that lasted between two or three months, something in that range. I've tried to block it out of my brain. It was uh, six or seven years ago, five or six years ago, something in that range. So 2006 or 2007. And one of the people in our trial, uh, and Dr. Bob would know who this is. Hi, Dr. Bob. Did you get another donut? Uh, one of the people, one of the people for Kelly, one of the one of the one of the people on our trial team uh, is is a doesn't appear in court. He's kind of a bodyguard, for lack of a better way of saying it. He's our he he takes care of protecting us and what we're about, including keeping watch on our hotel rooms when we're out of them, and and all sorts of things like that. So this this gentleman had a really rough um, growing up. Uh, he's about my age, and he had a, a rough-and-tumble father in a rough-and-tumble home. He'd spent some time as a police officer, uh, had a tough job working narcotics uh, in the line of duty. had killed some people. That's always going to affect you. Uh, he uh, had just been worked some of the underbelly uh, uh, of our society, and I don't know that he had ever been to a church before in his life. And he called, we would talk each morning as I was going to court and each evening as I was leaving from court. And I was talking to him one morning as I was headed to court and he said to me, he said, I need to ask you a question. I said, what's that? He said, well, you know, I, I, I'm in your hotel room every day to, to check on things, to make sure everything's okay. I said, right. He said, I can't help but notice you've got a Bible in there. I said, right. He said, and you move it around. <laughs> and I said, right. He said, well, I've been a little nosy. He says, you've been reading it because I can see the bookmarks moved. Of course, I'm teaching this class at the time. I got no choice but to be banging away at 3 in the morning if that's when it takes to finish the lesson, right? So I said, yeah, Tim, uh, or yes, uh, my friend, because I'm reading it. And he said, uh, he said, I got to read a Bible. He said, where do I buy one? Should have told him about the Gideons and said, look in your hotel bedroom, you know, little bedside table there. Uh, 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 I said, uh, I said, well, Go to Walmart, but when you get one, you, they're going to have several different translations. Don't get the King James. It's beautiful, it's wonderful, it's well done, but, but it won't make a lot of sense to you. You need to get one that's, that, look for one, for example, that has the initials N-I-V. That's very readable. And he says, so he's writing it down, N-I-V at Walmart. And I, he said, okay, I'm going to get it, and I'm going to start reading it. And I said, well, that, 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 wait, don't hang up. Don't read the Bible like you read a book, because you start at the beginning of a book, and you read to the end. And I got to tell you, there's this little thing called the end of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that's, that, that's due to stunt anyone's efforts at trying to read through it. And then if you make it through that, you're going to hit Job. And the first two chapters and the last three or four are pretty good. It's those middle 38 that are just bleary-eyed doozies. Not to mention the fact that you can only take so many Proverbs at a time before you're just reading, but you're just not registering. 
And don't even start me on the prophets. He said, what are you telling me? I said, well, when you get the Bible, I want you to look at the table of contents. It's going to divide the books up into the Old Testament and the New Testament. I want you to find the New Testament and look for the gospel according to John. I said, you get that. And that's, I said, the Bible's really a collection of books. That's the book you want to read first. So you read that book. And so that evening, I, I've got to admit, I totally forgot about this while I was at court. I'm driving back from court to the hotel. I call him. Everything okay? Our room's okay. Uh, you know, everything's fine. We're through with court. We're on our way back. Yep, everything's fine. He says, hey, I bought that Bible. I said, fantastic. I said, uh, uh, and I didn't want to say, have you started reading it yet? I'm going to quiz you. So I was just like leaving it on the down low. So I said, that's fantastic. He said, yeah, I read John. I said, really? Now, John is an amazing book. John is a book, St. John Chrysostom, who was a 4th century preacher of the church. Maybe the church's first notable megachurch type preacher. His, his nickname was Old Honeymouth because he just spoke words as tasty as honey. Old Honeymouth said the Gospel of John is a book suitable for children to paddle and elephants to swim. It's as, it's, I mean, you, it's great for the newbie, and it's, you can be as huge as you want and still go all the way under. And so I said, I said, uh, how'd it go? He said, well, I read the Gospel of John. I said, that's fantastic. He said, what do I read tomorrow? I said, read it again. He said, well, why do I read it again? I said, every time you read it, you're going to get something else out of it. Just keep reading it. Okay, so he, uh, he, he, <laughs> We were about two or three weeks from being done at the time, and I just kind of forgot about it. We finished the trial. A week later, I'm in New York City. I'm getting out of a taxi. I'm running late to give a speech. And I got to get in the elevator, get up there, hook up my computer, and give this speech. I'm running late, and I know I'm running late. And I'm looking at the time, and my phone rings, and it's him. I'm thinking, I don't have time for this. And I thought, well, I, 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 so I just picked it up. I said, hey, so-and-so, I literally have 60 seconds before I'm on an elevator and I'm going to lose this signal. What's up? He says, well, I've been reading the Gospel of John every day. He said, until today. And I just decided I'd read something else, so I read the Gospel of Matthew. And I said, yeah? He said, I'm going to hell. I said, what? He says, I'm going to hell. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, Mark, before I couldn't commit adultery. Now I'm not even supposed to lust. He said, before I couldn't kill someone. Now I'm not even supposed to hate them. I'm going to hell. What do I do? Now, I would love to tell you as your pious Sunday school teacher, I just announced to everybody, hey, I know I've committed to give a speech, but here's my opportunity to lead this soul to the Lord. So I'm just not going to give the speech and show up, and I'm going to stay on this phone and teach him about what he needs to do. But I did not do that. That would be a lie if I were to tell you I did that. So instead, I'm telling you the truth. I said, hey, buddy, I mean, I got 10 more seconds. He says, I got to know what to do. I said, quit reading Matthew. Go back and read the Gospel of John. And I hung up <laughs> with the promise that I'd get back to him in the next couple of days. Because I said, we need to visit face to face. I don't want to do this over the phone. So about two or three days later, it was the weekend. It was a Saturday because I was at home. And I got a phone call from him. And I saw the phone. I thought, oh, I haven't gotten back with him. Ah, oh, wow, wow, that's bad, that's bad, that's bad. And I picked up the phone. I said, yeah. He said, okay. Well, I went back and I started reading John again. But I'm telling you, I think I got it memorized. Did you know he wrote another book? <laughs> and I said, yeah. He said, there's this revelation of John. I said, yeah. He said, I read that. I said, yeah. He said, yeah, Matthew made me convinced I'm going to hell. Revelations made me scared to go outside my home. 
I said, okay, we need to meet. And he, uh, uh, we sat and we visited and he accepted Jesus as his Savior and Lord and has radically changed his life. Is a dear Christian brother to me, calls me regularly just to tell me what God's doing in his life and what scripture means something to him and all. But that's what got me started thinking. I wish we had a Bible that people could read like a book cover to cover. And so I started trying to figure out how to do that because even the best intended people struggle as they read Leviticus through Deuteronomy. And they, they just do. So I wanted this Bible and I wanted to figure out how we could do it and I searched everywhere for it and I couldn't find anything that really met what I wanted in a Bible. Enter Pastor David. David and I were having lunch a month and a half ago or two months ago, and I told David about this. And David said, well, what are you thinking? And I said, David, it's been on my heart to do this for a long time. I want to take the Bible, and, and I want to reorganize it, where it's built around uh, 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 John. It's built around maybe Acts. Maybe Revelation. I hadn't figured that out yet. I said, but I want to just take all the rest of the Bible and plug it in, kind of almost in a footnote fashion, where this is the context for what you're reading in the, these New Testament books. I said, I think that would be a dynamite book that people could, could give or, or take and read where they could read the God. You know, if you're reading the day-by-day -day Bible where you read the Bible through in a year, it's mid-October before you meet Jesus. It's day 285 before you get to Jesus. And I wanted a book that you could give to someone or that I could take and just read through. So I said this to Pastor David. So Pastor David said, well, why don't you do that? And I said, because I don't have time. And he said, well, why don't you take a hiatus from what you're teaching and teach that instead? And I said, well, I guess we could maybe do that. And he said, I'll go you a step further. He said, if you're going to do that, let's do it for the whole church. Let's put together this reading plan. He said, all you got to do is get like three or four months ahead of time. And once you get three or four months ahead of time, you can just sort of keep ahead of us. So that means by the end of the year, you've just got to have like January, February, March. I'm thinking, well, that's not that bad. I might could do that. Problem is, I'm set to try this horrible case out in California that's going to be all-consuming. And the other side has given no indication, and the judge has given no indication, will do anything but try it. So at this point, enter the, the mix into David's plan, the prayers of the saints. Folks out here who prayed for scheduling and, and prayed for these things. And, and lo and behold, we start the trial. We hand out the jury questionnaires. And the judge adjourns the trial for a couple of months. Which was just a phenomenal thing. So now all of a sudden, the time is freed up a little bit to try and get some of this done. So I decide I'm going to put all of the Bible together into a reading program where we can read through it in a year. But it's not reading Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. It's reading John, Acts, and Revelation with the other passages built in where they make contextual sense. So for example, yeah, the young lawyer comes up to Jesus and he's testing Jesus. And he says, hey, I got, a, I got a question. Just It's a lawyer question. Jesus says, yes, what's your question? He says, out of the entire law, which commandment do you think is the most important one? At which point, we're able to take a time out in the text and put in Deuteronomy and Leviticus where it says, don't mix fibers. 
put in the passages that talk about what you do when you find mold in your house, which actually may be of interest to some of y'all, what to do when you find mold in your house, put in the passages about an ox goring his neighbor, put in all of that, and then put in the Shema, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all, and then put in the passage that says for you to love your neighbor. Then you go back to Jesus. Jesus answers the young lawyer. says, well, it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The second's like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And anybody reading through that's going to say, yeah, he nailed that one. As the lawyer did who walked away. See, so there are ways to put this into context so that in the process of reading through these stories in the New Testament, you read the entire Bible. So that when... When Paul talks in Romans about uh, 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 the, the Abraham being saved by faith, we read the story of Abraham being saved by faith. When Stephen is giving his defense in Acts chapter 7, and Stephen starts with the Abraham and he works all the way through the judges and the, the prophets and the kings, we can stop and read about those things and make sense of what he's saying. So that's what I started to do. And I thought this is going to be easy. All I got to do is get two or three months. Well, it turns out, no. This is kind of like a Sudoku puzzle. Sudoku puzzle because you've got to end. In, I mean, it's all got to add up at the end. Turns out this is really hard. It's like building a three-dimensional puzzle with no box cover to tell you what it's supposed to look like. So I'm sitting there and I'm pulling my hair out and then in comes my friend Rick Meadow to tell me about his time in the Marines. How many of you are Marines? Okay. Thank you for your service to our country. Rick is the lawyer who runs my New York office. So Rick says to me, he's, he's down visiting on some work stuff and I said to him, I, and Rick comes here a lot. He may watch this message. He knows I'm praying for him to meet Jesus. So I still am, Rick. Um, so Rick says to me, he says, uh, um, uh, yeah, man, the Marines. I said, now tell me that story again. You were honorably discharged, right? He says, right. I said, and how long were you in there? 11 weeks. I said, how are you in the Marines for 11 weeks and you get honorably discharged? He says, well, it was kind of complicated. He says, I was in law school. I wanted to be a military lawyer. And I found out that if you do that in the Army, Air Force, or Navy, they put you into their judge advocate general course and you become a military lawyer. The Marines make even their military lawyers go through boot camp. And I said, yeah. He said, and I thought I'd do that. I said, why? He said, because I was thinking it was kind of like a, a workout thing. You know, I was going to get in the best shape of my life. Health spa. I said, really? And he says, I said, did you watch Gomer Pyle growing up? So I said, so uh, uh, he, says, he says, no, 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 no. So, so I said, well, what happened? He said, well, I knew I was in trouble. We have, they give us these rifles. And you have to take them apart and put them back together in like two minutes or something. I don't know, remember the time. He says, and the sergeant's barking at us with a stopwatch, marching up and down while we're doing it. He says, and I'm petrified. He says, you got to understand, I'm this short little Jewish boy from Queens. When, when the, on, on the first day when there are 500 of us in there, the guy calls out and says, okay, how many of you are Baptists? And a bunch of hands go up. How many of you are, you know, because they're sorting out for church services. How many of you are Catholic? A bunch of hands go up. Protest, uh, I mean Methodist, Presbyterian. And finally, as an afterthought, do we have any Jews? He says, mine's the one hand that goes up. And the captain looks out and says, you're on your own, boy. And I, that's, so he's already made a name for himself, right? So the guy's marching up and down. Rick's trying to get his rifle put back together while the stop is 15 seconds, 10 seconds, 5, 4, 3, 2, rifle's down. Rick says, and I got it put back together. My problem was I had three pieces left over. So I just <laughs> I shoved them in my pockets. <laughs> 
He's telling me this story. And all I can think about is, I'm putting this Bible together. The whole church is going to be looking at it. And I'm going to have parts I'm putting in my pocket when I'm through. Because I got it put together. I just left out one of the Proverbs or something, you know. So, now, that's it. Now, here's our goal. Our goal is the Gospel of John. Now, you may wonder, why is he doing this this Sunday? The reason is because this is our, if I do the, the Christmas service next Sunday, the Christmas lesson, we don't have Sunday school, life group after that for the rest of the year. So this is our warm up for next year. Here's the goal. We're going to have the Gospel of John, Acts of the Apostles, and Revelation, and we're going to use those as the backbone or the spine to which we'll attach the rest of the Bible as sinew and tissue and muscle and skin so that we read the whole thing off of that. Now, here's the process. What I did is I started out, I took a Bible, which I left in the car. Um, I took a Bible, like Steve's, and I started tearing out the pages. No, <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. I, 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 I took, I'm sorry, Steve. I love you like a brother. I took the Bible and I just thought, well, I'll just start with John 1. And so I got it to John 1. And in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And I thought, well, now there's a bunch of stuff I want people to read. When they read that, they need to go back and they need to read Genesis 1. They need to read Genesis 1, and they need to read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, because John is echoing Genesis, placing Jesus in creation, before creation. But they not only need to read that, we also need to read Psalm 136, which is a creation psalm. Psalm 136 takes it a little different. Give thanks to the Lord. Here, let's go to the Elmo. Look at Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for He's good. His steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His steadfast love endures forever. To Him who alone won. To him who alone does great wonders, his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens, his steadfast love endures forever. Spread out the earth above the waters, his steadfast love endures forever. Made the great lights, made the sun to rule over the day. Takes it back to creation, noting him alone, the Lord of lords, the King of kings, the one true God did these things, and John is saying, that's Jesus. He's making a claim for Jesus to be deity in that first verse. Don't ever let anybody say to you, oh, that's the church's doctrine that Jesus became deity. That wasn't what the original people thought. That's just developed. No, there's no doubt about it. That's what he's saying, chapter 1, verse 1 of his gospel. And it's also, he's saying, because Jesus was in the beginning, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, His steadfast love endures forever. And that refrain, that echo from Psalm 136 ought to be in our minds as we're reading John chapter 1. Because the advent of Jesus, the coming of Jesus, is the ultimate testimony that His steadfast love endures forever. And that's the kind of thing people can read and make sense of when we put it together this way. So I start out that way. I'm thinking, this is going really good. And then I'm starting to think through the Sudoku puzzle. So we go back to the PowerPoint. Sudoku. I can't even say it. How am I supposed to do it? <laughs> so I got this plan A. Well, then I'm starting to think, ah, yeah, this, isn't, this is a little tougher than I thought. I, I wind up, I got to go take a deposition in some town I can't even pronounce in Sweden. Now that's a downer, but it did mean I had 14 hours of flight time that's uninterrupted by anybody there and back. I'm thinking, man, I'm going to make it through a bunch of this stuff. So I'm sitting there and I'm banging away. This isn't, plan A only works for a while. Then you got to move to plan B. Okay, I'm going to be honest with you. Right now I'm on plan Q, but I'm still... <laughs> 
I'm still going through it, and I think we're going to make it. That's the process. Now, here's the status. Here's where I am right now because I want your help and I want your prayers. We're in this together, okay? These are the chapters I still have to figure out where they go. <laughs> now, that may be too small for you to read, and that's okay because I can email it to you. Um, where we're really hurting on this, uh, I'm telling you, the Chronicles stuff, it's, I got I to figure that out. I, I, I'm actually doing pretty good with the prophets because somewhere along the way before plan Q, I think it was about plan M or N or O, I decided, you know, I'm going to be in a whole lot of trouble when I get to Revelation because I'm going to have revelation, and then I'm going to have 20 chapters of Job's friends giving him sorry advice, and that's only going to, that's not really going to fit too well in revelation. That's easier to fit within Paul's experiences in Acts or within the uh, uh, epistles. So I need to do the back end. So I did revelation. And when you do revelation, you know, th th there's a saying that People who have trouble understanding Revelation just need to spend more time in the Old Testament. And we're going to do that. We're going to get to go through Revelation. You know, almost every phrase in Revelation comes straight out of the Old Testament. So it's real easy to take those and plug them in so that they make sense. And then Revelation just starts, it's like scales will fall off your eyes when you start reading it. And all this symbolism is understood as the Bible explains the Bible. A delightful way to do things. So, I've done the end, I've done the beginning, it's this middle part I've got to sort through and figure out how to do. Um, if anybody wants to just read through the Proverbs and tell me where they think some of those go, that'd be super. Hey, this proverb reminds me of that story, or this story, or that story. I'm all open for those emails. By the same token, I'm taking polls on where people think I should put Esther. Song of, Son Song of Solomon? Ah, put it with the wedding at Cana. God celebrates marriage. Where better to put it? But I can use some help on this stuff. I am over 66% done. You look at that list. Yeah. You look at that list, and that's bad. But that's less than, than, than a third. Um, that's... <laughs> To a lawyer, that's a contingent fee right there. Uh, we got 66% is done, okay? So, so I've just got to figure those things out. Now, there are pluses and minuses to this approach. And I want to be candid with them because ultimately you got to make a decision on going through this journey with us. I will tell you this. I'm still pledged to trying to prepare lessons regularly that are handouts because I think they'll help people. But there's more of a reason than that as well. Um, um, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Let me first tell you the pluses and minuses. <clears throat> Major plus. We're going to have a reader-friendly Bible when we're done. And, I, and I'm not... Now, some people will say, I suspect, because there's this haunting thing in the back of my voice saying, how dare you tinker with the Bible? I'm not tinkering with the Bible. I am tinkering with the way historically the church has put it together. But even that, I mean, Paul didn't write in chapters and verses. Those were added later. In fact, those have been added in the last 600 years. The order of the books, they were all originally written separately. It looks like the four Gospels were put together pretty early. And people used them as a group of four. It looks like Paul's epistles were probably accumulated by the end of the first century as a group of Paul's epistles. But we, we, the, it's lost in the, the shrouded mist of history how exactly the church put the Bible together. We don't even know. You know there are different theories, for example, on Paul's epistles. Why are they in the order they're in? They're not in the order that they were written. They're almost in the order of size, biggest to smallest, with the church epistles first and then the personal epistles afterwards, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. 
So you got the church epistles first. But we're not even sure of that. Some people think, no, it was more the more important churches. So first you have Rome, then you have Corinth, then you have Galatians, and then you have Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. But people don't even know. So I'm, I'm tinkering with the order a little bit, but I think all in good spirit, especially if you consider that for over a thousand years, the church has used approaches like this. They were called lectionaries. Um, they just didn't cover the whole Bible. And so we're not doing anything bad, but we are going to make it where it's got a reader-friendly attitude so that you could give it to a lost person and they would meet Jesus on day one. And they'll start out in the beginning and they'll end with Jesus coming to dwell again with man. And it's an appropriate set of bookends with the, the, the gospel story throughout. So, next, amazing insights. When you do the Bible this way, I've noticed, and I'm, I'm going to give you some examples here in a moment. There are some amazing things that begin to open up. And for me, I'm 53. I have cared about the Bible all my life. I was, I was 13, maybe 14 in that age when I decided for the first time I'm going to read the Bible all the way through in a year. And that's something I've tried to do for a number of different years. I did it at that age, but if you had given me a quiz, I would not have passed it. Because there would be many a night I'd just be sitting there going, oh, i got to get this done. Because I'm a checklist guy. <clears throat> but I made it through. In spite of the fact I've been doing that for over four decades, I have found things in just the last month of this that I've never realized before in the Bible. It's, it's amazing what it's done to me. And I think that'll be amazing to you as well. It's being put together so that you do, if you make this commitment with me, you get to read through the Bible next year. One year. Read through the whole Bible. Which is kind of a cool thing to do. I dare say many of us have tried, but I'll suspect the percentage of success is somewhere around 10%, even in a class like this. So, uh, it's also a three-layer cake. Now, this is Pastor David's analogy, and we can do a better cake than that. Here, let's do a Mark Wilkie cake. <clears throat> it's a three-layer cake, and this is, is what Pastor David explained to me and, and what you need to know about and, and is exciting. First of all, it's the personal study level. You can choose to read. By the way, you still get to come to class even if you don't. You say, I don't want to read through the Bible in a year. I've got a busy year. That's fine. Or I've got my own program I'm on. That's fine. There's not judgment. This is not a legalistic thing. It's an opportunity. And it, for those who want to take advantage of it, great. Those who don't, please come to class anyway. But there's that level. And David's even trying to get this on an app so that on the app you can pull up each day, not just the Scripture Tie, uh, a verse, chapter and verse, but the actual scriptures themselves so that you can read it on the app. And he's got the people working on that aggressively here. <clears throat> um, it, will it be printed? Ultimately, uh, yes and no. I you will be getting from me monthly handouts that are a month ahead of time of the calendar. But we're also looking to publish it and we're in contact with the... English Standard Version publishers and the New International Version publishers. And if this really works and we get it right, who knows, maybe the Gideons will pass these out one day. We'll put it because this is a marvelous way to read Scripture where you read it like a book. So, um, first level, personal study. It's a chance for us to read it. Now, in your handout today, you've got your first week of January. And I'll make sure Steve emails it as well. But in fact, what you've got in the handout today, right before the, the news break where you get to meet the Setons, you've got, if we go to the Elmo for a moment, this is January as it exists right now. 
Hey, I give you Sunday off. It's a day of rest. So you come to church. Sunday, those scriptures in Sunday are just what you've covered that week in John. But you've got your entire, you know, on, on January 1st, zoom in. You read John 1, 1 through, through 3. Then you read Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3. Psalm 136, Isaiah 40, 12 through 40, 31, and Psalm 104. You're done. Next day, you're still on the same John passage, but you're going to read Job, where God grills Job and says, Hey, Mr. Wisdom will die when I die. Where were you when I created the heavens? Where were you? You tell me how I measured out the skies. You tell me how I built the land. You tell me da 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 da. It's 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 a good bit to read. So, you this is the reading that, and then we will next convene on this, and and let's we'll print this calendar again next week for the Christmas one, but we'll next convene on Sunday, January fifth, after we've started this. Now, if we go back to the PowerPoint, I'll tell you what goes next. So this personal study program and these passages will be put out for us, but they'll also be put out for the church at large because Pastor David and Pastor Ramon in Spanish and Pastor Trammell at the North Campus and Pastor Richards and even the youth pastors, Jeff Skipper and Steve Morris, are all going to be preaching out of this next year. But the way the preaching will be done, it will be done from John, Acts, and Revelation. So it's that layer of the cake. And then the life groups will get into all the support scriptures, the context behind it. And, and when I say the life groups, only those that choose to. But the, the materials that I'm writing for our class... I'm also writing for the classes at large so that they can take that written material. I think Jared Richard is going to help put some teacher notes together that kind of say, here are the five things I'd cover if I were teaching this. But together that goes in a package for our whole church life groups, those that are interested, to use as well. It's being translated into Spanish. It's being used in the Spanish life groups. It's an amazing thing that we're starting here with the goal being not only to have a publishable scripture, but to have published with it a sermon series and a study guide for life groups so that we're able to put this out for use in the kingdom and in the world at large. So that's the three-layer cake. Those are the pluses. Yeah, I'm excited. Oh, I'm so excited. Now, the lawyer in me says, uh, uh, warning, manufacturers warning do not apply. Da, 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 da. Um, I need to give you that. You lose some immediate context when you do this because things are taken from one place and moved to another. So you realize that, and, and if you need more context, you go back and you find it or this isn't the only way you study. But you need to know that. The second thing is, is there are some passages that are used in a number of different places, and I only get to plug them in once. Abraham's mentioned more than once in the New Testament. And so the stories of Abraham, I've got to put in as, as they seem to fit. But those are some negatives. Now, having said all of that, let me give you a good sample for a moment. And I pulled up three of them, not knowing how much time we'd have. We've got 11 minutes. If you can bear with me for 11 minutes, I'll give you some samples. Nathaniel's call. Nathaniel's call takes January 22nd and January 23rd. And if you're reading it in John, it's a pretty easy story to read. It's just John 1, 43 through 51. John 1... 43, ah, here it is. So, we read the following. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we found him of whom Moses in the law 
And also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, Nathanael said to him, can, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said, well, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and says of Nathanael, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said, How do you know me? Jesus said, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, which means my teacher, you are the Son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, you believe? You're going to see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now you read that story. And if you're relatively new to the story, you might start thinking, well, Nathaniel's an egotistical little fellow, isn't he? Nathaniel comes up to Jesus, a cynic. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Comes up a cynic, and just because Jesus says, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Then he's kind of like, Wow, you know me? <laughs> and he's ready to worship him? To make him his rabbi, his teacher? He's ready to, to, to call him the son of God? And then Jesus says, before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you? And this blows Nathaniel away? And Nathaniel's response is trembling? And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, you're going to see even greater things. You're going to see the heavens opened and the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now in your reading that day and the next day, I take you to the story of Jacob. Jacob means grasp. But it also comes from the verb, or sounds like the verb that means to deceive. Jacob is one of two twins, we'll read. Jacob and Esau are born. And Esau is born first, and Jacob comes out second, grasping the heel of his brother. But not just grasping, Yaakov is also deceiving. See, Jacob comes, the deceiver comes, the deceitful one comes, and deceitfully gets his father's blessing. Deceitfully manipulates his brother out of his birthright for some stew. In God's ironic, you reap what you sow, the deceit gets turned around, and instead of the younger deceiving the older and getting the older's blessings... When Jacob's working for the young sister wife, he gets dumped with the older one, Leah. He got tricked. But there comes a time where God addresses him and he wrestles with God and he wrestles with God's angel at the Jabbok. And in that time, God changes his name and says, you're no longer the deceitful one. Now you are Israel. And from you will come forth the great nation. You are now Israel, and in you there's no more Yaakov. There's no more deceiver. There's no more deceit. And Jacob has a dream. He dreams the heavens open and there's a staircase. And the angels are going up and down the stairs from heaven to earth. And he names that place House of God, Bethel, 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 House of God. And, and he names it that because the, it looks like that's God's staircase. Now, a number of scholars would be quick to tell you that the odds are pretty good, the way John's writing, 
that Nathanael's sitting under a tree either dreaming or thinking about Jacob and thinking about Jacob's dream and thinking about the deceiver, the deceitful one who becomes Israel. And so Nathanael the cynic, the skeptic, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Come and see, okay? And as he approaches, Jesus, knowing his thoughts from afar, says, ah, behold. Now there's an Israel light in whom there is no deceit. Direct reference back to Jacob. Nathaniel's like, wait, how do you, how do you know me? How, how'd you know what I was thinking? How'd you know what I was reading or meditating on? How'd you know what I was working through? How'd you, how'd you get in my brain? And Jesus says, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I know what you were thinking. And Nathaniel's like, okay, that's good enough for me, Rabbi, son of God. And Jesus says, oh, you hadn't seen anything yet. You will get to see the heavens open. And you'll see the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. You'll see the real bridge that bridges heaven and earth on Calvary. Because I'm that bridge. I am what the staircase that goes from heaven to earth and from earth to heaven. No one gets up there unless they traverse through me. And I'm the one who came down from there. I'm that staircase. It's a tremendous way to take that story and put it in. So if we go back to the PowerPoint. Now, some of these stories make sense if someone will explain them. Some of the passages you'll be reading saying, why did Lanier put this in there? And there'll be a couple of possibilities. One, I was sleepy. Two, it makes sense. We're just going to have to get to Sunday school to find out what. Or in the book, maybe a footnote helps explain it. But your point for home from this one is, God calls you. Don't think God only knew what Nathaniel... I can't, I can't leave points for home out. Don't think God only knew what Nathaniel was thinking. God knows what each one of us is thinking. I mean, isn't that the promise of Jesus when he says, hey... Pray like this, but don't, don't think you're going to be heard because of all of your words. Don't you think God already knows what you're thinking? Knows what you want? The psalmist, before a word is on my mouth, you know it all together. God knows each of us. He calls each of us no differently and no less than he called Nathaniel or Philip or the others. Everyone's got a role before him. And now we've got choice. We can come and see and respond, my teacher, Rabbi, you're the son of God. Or we can just say, eh, I don't think anything good comes out of Nazareth, at least nothing worthy of my time and attention. I'm going to stay where I am. Those are our choices, but the call is there. Now, if we had time, uh, I'd whet your appetite with John the Baptist and the Lamb of God. You know John the Baptist? Oh, we've got a minute and a half. Okay, get a load of this. All right. John the Baptist points to Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, when was the last time one of y'all sacrificed anything for a sin offering? I mean, like a live animal, just killed it, dead, cut the entrails, smoked them, did all of that. Okay, I didn't think so. Just a few. Um, to the Jews in Jesus' day, the rites of sacrifice were as commonly understood and known and practiced. They'd been doing it for over a thousand years. They were as commonly understood and practiced as street signs are today to someone who drives. Now, most people who drive do not confuse a stop sign with a speed limit sign. I have on occasion, but <laughs> most of us don't. A good Jew in Jesus' day would not mix up a sin offering sacrifice with some other, 
with a burnt offering that was just intended as a burnt offering, with an offering for uh, uh, any diff- number of different reasons that they had them. If you want to go back, almost every sin offering was always a goat, not a lamb. Almost every sin offering was a female sheep, if you're doing the sheep. If you want to find a male lamb for a sin offering, go back to the Passover. Even the Day of Atonement, when the, it's the goat that takes the sin of the people that's driven out, one slaughtered, one's driven out of the camp. That's a goat. Separate sheep and goats, they're different. John didn't say there's the goat of God. He said the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. You read that day, and we'll talk about it that Sunday, about why it's there. That's your teaser to make you want to go. So behold, the Lamb's your teaser. We don't have time for me to give you the third one. We're, we're in John 1.15, he says, uh, uh, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. Some tremendous stuff out of the Old Testament for that. And, and basically your point for home would be commit to study. So I'm going to ask Stephen to pray for us on this. And I'm going to, um, uh, uh, I've got to head to the airport. But with all the love in my heart, I really hope you guys will go on this journey. I hope you'll pray for it. I hope you'll help us. And, and I'm, my goal right now is before we end December to have the entire calendar done next year. So all we've got to do is tweak it. So just keep praying for me to, 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 to have some wisdom beyond what I have on my own to get that done. God bless you guys. Steve, would you close us in prayer? So with that, let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for Mark. I thank you for his passion, the way that you have just revitalized um, his excitement and passion and in teaching and everything else. Not that it was ever discouraged, but it's just a whole new level now. Thank you for the way that you have done that. Please give Mark really good insight and good recall and, and help us to be able to pray and support him as he seeks to provide an integrated study where the Bible is commentarying on the Bible. Thank you for Mark and his heart and for Becky and the whole family and the way that they support him and allowing him to teach our class. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.